All right, we're going to be starting in just a moment, everybody. Uh, we're juggling two audiences right now. We have a fantastic online audience. We want to thank you again for joining us online. We really appreciate it, and we apologize for the 10-minute delay. It's kind of awkward that I know all of you see me here in person, see me here with a mic, but we don't have a PA system, but I'm a loud guy, so you can hopefully hear my voice project in this space easily. Uh, we are starting a bit late, so we're going to get started in just a moment, everybody. Thank you again for coming today. Good afternoon to all of you. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to wherever you are watching on the live stream. Thank you for tuning in on the live stream. My name is Matthew Toro, and again, I want to apologize for the slight delay in our start time, but we have uh, some technical issues and some traffic delays. In any case, uh, you're all here to celebrate something we're calling Dutton's Atlas. Uh, the full name of the project is How Cartography Helped the Canyon Become Grand. And I'm going to ask my dear friend Matt Trobaugh to help me with that audio. Can we, can we cut off that uh, fantastic classical music? Yeah. I mean, it's great, because I, I, I like to live an epic life. So I like epic like, or Looney Tunes life, right? <laughs> Actually, I would, love, I would love this soundtrack to follow me around everywhere I go. That's how I feel when I move through this world. Thank you, Trobot. And I just want to acknowledge so many people. Uh, uh, we have so many strange technical situations, but we're going to make it work for you all. We had full disclosure to my uh, live stream audience and my in-person audience. Uh, we have so many strange challenges here to, uh, for this, for this uh, half-day symposium, but I just want to acknowledge so many people. But right now, I want to acknowledge that handsome gentleman right there, Matt Trobaugh, who bends over backwards. Really, he deserves, really. Matt Trobaugh has been here since 7 a.m bending over backwards to make this event work and another ASU library event, so kudos to Matt Trobaugh, now and always. Again, let's get right into it. My name is Matthew Toro, and uh, I have until 12.30 to welcome you all and introduce you all to today's half-day symposium. Like I said just a few moments ago, we're here to discuss a 19th century masterpiece, uh, really the first comprehensive work of geology and geomorphology uh, for the Grand Canyon region, the, 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 the Grand Canyon District, as, uh, as the namesake of this project, Clarence Dutton once called it. And we have so many experts here to really contextualize and curate and add meaning and insights and, and explain what, what this project is all about. But I'm going to just briefly uh, go through some of my introductory slides. Let's hope the slide deck works. But welcome again. Again, my name is Matthew Torr. I should be more formal here. I have a really cool-sounding, grandiose title. I'm the director of MAPS imagery and geospatial services here at ASU Library. In practice, that means I run a unit just to my left here in person called the Map and Geospatial Hub. And for sort of succinctness, I like to describe the Map and Geospatial Hub as one part map library, one part GIS center. So really we're taking um, sort of historical map-based cartographic documents, typically embodied in big flat pieces of paper, and we get to apply or apply modern sophisticated GIS technologies to do really fantastic things with these historic map resources. And we, we do all sorts of projects at the Map and Geospatial Hub, but this project right here, Dutton's Atlas, How Cartography Helped the Canyon Become Grand, is really a perfect um, sort of manifestation or embodiment of the type of work we do at the Map and Geospatial Hub. Here we're looking at an original, uh, to my left over here on that table, that is indeed an, an original 1882 edition of the Tertiary History of the Grand Canyon District. The Tertiary History of the Grand Can Canyon District is both a monograph and atlas pair. They are meant to be sort of a combined couple. And um, as you'll learn with briefly with and superficially with my presentation and more in-depth with the subsequent presentations, um, as one would expect with uh, an atlas, right, Dutton's atlas, um, it is a book of maps, right? But it is so much more than a book of maps. And I'll elaborate, that, I'll elaborate upon that in just a few moments. But um, I do encourage you all to check out the Map and Geospatial Hub here today in person or for our audience, wherever you're viewing from. Please come visit us. We're here in Hayden Library in uh, the center of Tempe, Arizona, a suburb of the Phoenix metropolitan region. And we'd be most happy to host you and show you some maps and show you some cool data and projects, et cetera. All right. So let's get right into it, my friends. We're here to discuss this, as I just said. What is Dutton's Atlas? I've been running around this library for the past several days and weeks, telling all my colleagues about it, hopefully sort of being a cheerleader and banging the drum about this project. And a lot of them ask, Matthew, what is Dutton's Atlas? Well, it is quite simply an atlas that we're um, call, formerly called the Tertiary History of the Grand Canyon District, but we're, for simplicity, calling it Dutton's Atlas. It's named after a gentleman uh, named Clarence Dutton, Clarence Edward Dutton, and uh, let me talk more about that guy in just a second. But a quick disclaimer, I am not a geologist. 
I'm a geographer by training, hence the reason why I have very competent geologists in the form of Dr. Steve Semkin and the form of Miss Peyton Slosser here. Um, did I butcher it? Yeah, <laughs> good. Um, so they can actually provide the proper, in-depth, credible ge geological information that I cannot. But just at a superficial level, that term tertiary is a little perplexing, maybe confusing to some of you. Um, after sort of Googling around and talking to my colleagues who are much more knowledgeable, just the quick sort of definition of it, tertiary is a widely used but now obsolete term referring to uh, a particular geological era. Specifically, unless someone fact checks me and I'm incorrect, we're talking about approximately 66 million to 2.6 million years ago. So we're essentially, it's the tertiary is essentially the merging of the paleogene, so-called early tertiary, and the neogene. And that is perhaps the only slide I will have with words on it and the only time I will read bullets to you, my friends. Um, so, as I was saying just a few moments ago, Dutton's Atlas, a.k.a. It's formerly named the Tertiary History of the Grand Canyon District, is, as its name suggests, a book of, so sorry, it is uh, an atlas. And as we would all come to expect from any atlas, any contemporary atlas, an atlas is a book of maps, right? This is not any atlas. It is any regular sort of atlas. It is important on so many levels, from so many different angles, so many dimensions. First and foremost, and all my colleagues will talk more about this, but it is the first formal publication of the United States Geological Survey. There's a little bit of a, of a nuance there. Technically, it's called Volume 2 of the USGS Monograph Series, but it is technically the first publication, and I'll leave it to my other scholar uh, collaborators to talk more in depth about that. But apart from being the first publication of the USGS, it is not an atlas that you would find published today by, uh, the U by the United States Geological Survey. It has a combination of not only maps, as we would all come to expect, but phenomenal landscape art. We're talking about really uh, fantastically drawn landscape views, landscape panoramas, landscape renditions, uh, mostly by William Henry Holmes and by Thomas Moran. I'm sure most of you have heard the name Thomas Moran, a famous you know, uh, 19th century American landscape painter. Maybe fewer of you have heard the name William Henry Holmes, but the majestic art pieces in this atlas are primarily uh, attributed to Holmes here. And uh, so of course we have some of, the, some of the earliest, most authoritative topographic and of course geological maps for the Grand Canyon ever produced. And it's really important to think about the broader sort of arc of cartographic history in, this, in the mapping of this extremely remote area of northwestern Arizona, the so-called Arizona Strip area, for so long, one of the most remote and difficult to access areas, even to this day, right? If you're, if you're land bound, if you're, if you're traversing this region by land, you have to cross the Navajo Bridge, right, to even make it to the north side of the canyon. Um, so it's still extremely inaccessible land. Um, so this was really the first atlas to credibly, authoritatively map Grand Canyon. Now, of course, many of you are thinking, well, what about John Wesley Powell? He was the first uh, sort of canyon explorer scientist to successfully traverse the length of the Colorado River through Grand Canyon, of course. First in 1869, sort of a mixed bag of success, a scientific failure, if you will. They lost a lot of their equipment. It turned into a, a, a matter of survival primarily. Three men sort of tragically decided to take their risk upland at Separation Rapid. They got tragically killed, a forever unsolved mystery. Who did it? Uh, members of LDS, Church of Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Or was it, as the official records suggest, uh, a band of Shivwitz Paiute Indians? Uh, historians love to debate those topics in depth, and it's really juicy stuff. Nevertheless, in 1869, um, Powell left the river without having successfully mapped it, as was really the intention. At the very least, mapping the confluence of the main Colorado River with the little Colorado River. Um, so he went back uh, two years later, 1971, 1972, got more appropriations from Congress. Uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm out of order here. I'm showing fantastic landscape views uh, from the Atlas, but I'll jump to it. This one's called the Transept. I'll let my colleagues talk more about it. This one's called the Toro Weep. Let me jump. Uh, let me jump down to this guy, Clarence Dutton, of course. Um, but yeah, back to Powell. So sorry, I'm jumping around like that. Powell in 1869, kind of a. Uh, partially successful trip. He survived, right? Went back in 71, 72. I'm a little nervous because I have Richard David Quartaroli here, who's probably the foremost expert on John Wesley Powell's 1869 and subsequent 71, 72 expeditions. In any case, the, Powell, the subsequent Powell expedition did indeed produce some of the first authoritative maps of the region, but they weren't published until his cartographer, uh, Frederick uh, Dellenbaugh actually published it in his book in 1909, A Canyon Voyage. So, um, and there's Powell. You know, Powell really became a bureaucrat 
for the USGS, assuming the directorship of the USGS after the first director of that agency, Clarence King, uh, decided to sort of renounce his throne, if you will, no pun intended. So Powell became a bureaucrat. He had to delegate his scientific work, which was really rightfully his, to, to delegate his work of ongoing topographic and more importantly, geological inquiry into the Grand Canyon. He had to delegate that to uh, a trusted and competent collaborator. And he did that, of course, in, uh, by handing it over to that handsome guy, Clarence Button, here. My point with all this, my friends, is that the tertiary history of the Grand Canyon really marked a shift um, away from sort of raw exploration and raw topographic mapping, just trying to say, what is the sheer physical geography? What, is, what are the landscapes here? Where does the river connect to the Little Colorado? Where does the river spit us out after Diamond Point, uh, you know, um, where Joseph Christmas Ives and his previous uh, 1858 expedition had been. And uh, so we, John Wesley Powell hands his sort of legacy, his geological legacy, over to Clarence Dutton because John Wesley Powell had assumed the directorship of not only the USGS, but also of the Smithsonian's Bureau of Ethnology. So Powell's now a firm, although he's famous and you know he's a one-armed Civil War veteran, short, stocky guy, but you know people listen to him. He speaks with authority. He eventually becomes a very controversial figure in Washington, of course. Um, but he had to delegate his work, and we're moving away from a time where we're just exploring and figuring out what is there to finally understanding what's how does it work, right? Geologically, what are the so-called quote unquote, and I'm quoting Dutton here, what are the so-called geological problems? How did these otherworldly landscapes come to be. And of course, the tertiary history of the Grand Canyon District is not only a, an atlas, it's a monograph. And the reason why this is a humanities grant, and obviously uh, I, I must recognize our generous sponsors, uh, the Arizona Humanities and a consortium of ASU people, but the reason why this project is funded primarily as a humanities grant is because the work of Clarence Dutton in the tertiary history, oh, that's Powell, let me shift to Dutton, um, is, is not just a work of sheer geology. I'm gonna, I, I just got a flag from my colleague Peyton here that I need to hurry up and I need to get organized, but let me, let me get back to this arc of cartography here. Here's a, here's a, a depiction of, of the so-called Explorer. That's the name of a steamboat, and that's being led by Joseph Christmas Ives, uh, a lieutenant in the Ar U.S. Army Corps of Engineer. Back then, it was called the War Department, right? We now call it the, the Department of Defense. Nice rhetorical change right there. But back in the day, the War Department was, was really in charge of all topographical mapping within the United States. Well, just a, few, uh, just a decade later, in 1848, after the Mexican-American War, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the United States blossoms exponentially, right? Uh, the, the territorial extent of the United States then shifts all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Manifest Destiny is territorially reified. Well, there's a lot of Mormon uh, skirmishes, and there's a concern by the federal government in Washington that the Mormons might be allying themselves too strongly with the Native American groups. And that's, you know, you have a sort of rambunctious indigenous groups supposedly, you know, causing, ha wreaking havoc supposedly for the federal government, potentially working closely with the Mormons. And that was uh, an issue of concern. So they sent Joseph Christmas Ives, a lieutenant with the U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Topographical Engineers, to take a steamboat up the lower Colorado River. The, the, mo the, the, the lowest elevation, the flattest part of the river, the most well-known part of the river. So they take a steamboat, they push up, they make it basically as far as Hoover Dam, if you will, what's currently under Lake Mead right now. And, um, and you know, Joseph Christmas Ives is, uh, eventually they, they hit a rock and they basically have to make it an overland journey. Joseph Christmas Ives notoriously, infamously says, our party will be the last party of whites, I'm paraphrasing here, but he did use these key terms. Our party will likely be the last party of whites to ever visit this profitless locality, right? I'm sure many of my other collaborators will, will likely invoke that, that infamous saying as well. The point is that how wrong was Joseph Christmas Ives? Poor guy, we all bash him now in the contemporary era. He just, you know, wasn't in touch with reality at the time. He didn't have the vision. But Clarence Dutton and his collaborator and sort of his mentor, you know, he was a protege of John Wesley Powell. But the work of John Wesley Powell in 1875 with his explorations of the canyons of the Colorado, which of course was written more like an adventure novel rather than a geological treatise, which was really Powell's original intention. But for various political and, and other reasons, Powell had to frame it more like an adventure novel. So Powell's explorations of the, of the canyons of the Col Colorado, coupled with Dutton's work on the tertiary history of the Grand Canyon, really did some mental work on us collectively. And that's the whole point of how cartography helped the canyon become grand. My esteemed colleague here, Dr. Stephen Pine, I'm a major fanboy of this guy, and I begged him, I groveled him, and, and I was so, it's truly, uh, for, for a guy like me to have Stephen Pine 
Dr. Stephen Pine, be willing to work with me. I'm going to tear up here. Oh, gosh. It's a big deal. No, I'm an emotional guy. It's a big deal. But I remember reading his 2001 New Forward in the University of Arizona reproduction, republication of just the monograph, not the atlas, but just the monograph of the tertiary history. And I'm going to butcher him. <laughs> Stephen Pine's an eloquent guy. I'm talking about him in the third person like he's not here. But he said, he said something to the effect that, uh, you know, Clar what Clarence Sutton saw uh, can never be unseen. And I'll let him say it right out of the horse's mouth more eloquently as it should be properly written and stated. But that's the point of all this. Clarence Dutton gave us a vocabulary and a sense of a, and, and a, and a new landscape aesthetics, not only with his very literary prose, which was very evocative and really built in our minds uh, a very beautiful notion and a new, sense of, a, a new set of, of words and vocabulary and a new way to describe what was previously a very otherworldly um, landscape. And, of course, the United States, being a country dominated by Euro-Americans, colonized by Euro-Americans, primarily an East Coast country where the, the, machination, the machinations of government, the political economic levers, if you will, uh, command and control center in Washington, D.C., you know, we're so far removed from these Western landscapes. And the work of John Wesley Powell and Clarence Dutton really did a number on us psychologically. It helped these Western bureaucrats. It helped the mainstream American population sort of makes sense. A landscape that was heretofore, previous to then, previous to that time, unimaginable. Because indeed, prior, until you really see the Grand Canyon, it, it's, it's almost unimaginable. But what the work of cartography, the work of those maps, of repackaging these grand spaces, and the work of these other kinds of maps, if you'll indulge me with the very liberal notion of what a quote-unquote map is, these gorgeous landscape panoramas, what is a map, ultimately? It's a way to communicate geographical reality, to explain geographical space. And it, it, that's a lot of lofty language, but think about that. It's really hard to convey vast landscapes. John Wesley Powell, I'm going to paraphrase him, he says something to the effect of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard for the mind to envision grand topo topographic forms, right? And I'm going to leave it at that because I'll butcher the quote. But the point is, maps allow us to repackage and rescale those grand topographic forms. So these maps, cartography, simple, the simple humble map, topographic map or geologic map, combined with these other types of quote unquote maps, these fantastical landscape views, coupled additionally with very evocative literary prose, these, these elements combined, these visual communication elements and these textual communication elements really um, uh, sort of imbue us with our understanding of the canyon. And indeed, as Pine far more eloquently stated, it is something that we can never unsee. Dutton's view, uh, which is a whole sort of section in Pine's uh, 1999 book, How the Canyon Became Grand, and if you haven't made the connection by now, this project, Dutton's Atlas, pulls directly or in invokes directly the work of Stephen Pine here. But Dutton's view can never be unseen by us. And uh, anyway, I want to re-welcome you all here. Thank you for hearing my very unstructured talk all over the place. There's so many gems. I'm going to very briefly, because I'm looking at my slides, I'm like, wow, I didn't go by these at all. But I just want to talk, I just want to leave this uh, slightly unstructured or uh, horrendously unstructured presentation with a few slides to highlight the work of my right-hand woman on this project, Miss Peyton Schlosser. And she's been absolutely phenomenal. Wow, I really packed this in here. All right. But yes, I hope you all, you've all visited by now. Obviously, our friends on the live stream have seen the website. This is where you're hopefully accessing the live stream. But um, we, have, we haven't only put together the symposium for you, where I'm up here doing a song and dance, but we've made a whole interactive exhibit for you. And really, the most substantive, meaningful part, and again, all credit goes to Peyton Schlosser here, our phenomenal uh, geology senior here. Um, really couldn't do any of this without Peyton. This whole project stands on Peyton's shoulders here. Um, you open these maps, and we have digitized and georeferenced and added, put all these maps into interactive web mapping application formats. And Peyton herself will show you some of the magic of those maps. But kudos to Peyton in advance. We can give her a proper recognition when she speaks. And it's really, um, really phenomenal what she's done. I'll just give you a glimpse of that. And of course, I want to acknowledge my right-hand man. Where is he? Or left-hand man, Eric Friesenhan. He might be down at the exhibit. Oh, there he is right there. If you haven't checked it out already, there is a three-dimensional model. For all of you in-person folks here, you know that there's a physical real-world exhibit. It's fantastic. Kudos to my colleague Amy Watson at ASU Library. She did a phenomenal job uh, coordinating all the production and doing the design of it. But Eric Friesenhan, working in tandem with me and so many others, and trust me, you could tell I'm a demanding 
uh, despite how sort of unstructured I am right now, I, I demand a lot from my staff. And Eric, sort of on a whim, this was not part of the original scope of the project. Eric, under immense pressure from me, was sort of coerced into doing this. But as always, Eric did a phenomenal job. So no matter what, when this physical, real-world exhibit comes down sometime in December, we, it will live in posterity, in perpetuity, right there online for people to, to enjoy um, forever. So kudos to Eric for... Uh, exercising his technical prowess and modeling with very sophisticated GIS and three-dimensional modeling tools that space. That is a screenshot of an interactive map. All those items are selectable and you can get curatorial uh, context about all of those items. 